The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this afternoon's webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about how to choose a microphone 101, give you all the details you need to know um, on the tips and tricks and the science aspect of, of choosing a microphone for your application. Um, my name is Cheryl Jennison DeProsa, and I'm joined today by Gino Sujismondi, and we are joined by special guest John Bourne, who is a wired microphone product manager here at Sure. So they're going to talk you all through the different the different points of how to choose a microphone and, and the pertinent information you'll need to know going into making that decision. But before we get to that, just a couple of items of housekeeping. Housekeeping. Uh, first of all, this webinar will be recorded, so you can always go to shore.com slash training and see all of our archived webinars there. There's a lot of great information, so please feel free to peruse that site. Lots of great learning. And then second of all, at the end of the webinar today, if there are any questions, we will get to those as many of those as we can as time permits. Um, in the right-hand side of your screen, you should see sort of a little toolbox window pane there where you can write in your questions. If you don't see it, just look for the little toolbar with the orange box with the white arrow and click on that and that will maximize that pane and give you the ability to ask questions. So that wraps up all the business. Let's get into the important stuff. Take it away, Gino and John. All right. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you, John, for being here. My pleasure. Good afternoon. It's good to have you. Um, so uh, again, as, as Cheryl said, John is one of our product managers here for Wired Microphones at Sure, uh, as well as being an active sound engineer in the Chicago market as well. So uh, getting the, the practical experience as well as the, uh, the product experience here. So it's uh, great to have you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, so what we're going to talk about here today is how to choose a microphone. Um, it's a question that, as you might imagine, we we get a lot around here, and there's uh, there's uh, there's a couple of different aspects to it. It 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 sounds like a cliche, but it is an art and a science because uh, one of the things you have to do, if at all possible, is listen to the microphone yourself. I mean, ultimately, what it really comes down to is, you know, you've got to have a microphone that, you know allows you allows your sound to come through the way you imagine it to or the way you think it should and that's something that often you can only determine by by auditioning mics but of course there's thousands of microphone choices out there so how could you possibly narrow them down and that's where the science aspect of it kind of comes in so what we're really going to try and do here afternoon to here this afternoon is go through uh the kind of sort of mic basics 101 the characteristics that help define microphones and then in the second half uh well actually probably less than half but the second part of the webinar uh kind of then show you how you apply those different um those different uh scientific basics i guess to the art part of choosing the right microphone so um you could, there's there's so many different applications we couldn't possibly uh, get to them all but at least you can see kind of the thought process that you go into when looking at mic characteristics and figuring out how those might apply to your to your individual situation so with that said let's talk about microphone characteristics and the first thing we're going to talk about is how the microphone does its job, um, what its operating principle is, and then we're going to talk about directional response and frequency response, and then some other characteristics that are maybe not quite as important, but still things you should keep in mind, which are uh, the electrical output of the microphone as well as its physical design. So starting with the operating principle, again, this is how a microphone does what it does. And a microphone is a transducer, which is anything that takes one form of energy and turns it into another form of energy. In the case of a microphone, it's converting the sound waves of variations in air pressure that we perceive as or call sound waves and changes them into an electrical signal, actually a varying voltage. And then that electrical signal can be used for a variety of other purposes, whether it's simply uh, amplifying the sound source to make it louder for reinforcement applications or uh, capturing capturing it for recording purposes to be manipulated and retransmitted later on or whatever you happen to need to do with it, um, the microphone's job is the same in, in any application there. There are a couple of different ways in which the microphone can convert sound waves into electrical energy. The primary ones are the ones you, you, you find most commonly in present day applications would be the dynamic microphone and uh, close behind it, the condenser microphone. Uh, ribbon microphones, which is sort of a close cousin of the dynamic microphone, is also um, 
something that was more of a historical microphone that has kind of recently had a comeback and is, uh, you know, kind of, we kind of shifted it back up into the primary category there. Uh, there are other ways of, of doing this as well, you know, um, crystal microphones and carbon microphones and controlled magnetic microphones and a lot of these other technologies that have sort of fallen by the wayside. You don't really see them or they're very specialized at least, but for the kind of uh, applications that we normally deal with, it's, you know, you're going to be uh, dynamics and condensers with the occasional ribbon mic. So starting with dynamic microphones here, you can see a couple of sort of popular ones um, shown here, the SM57 on the left and the uh, 55 Unidyne, the actually latest incarnation of it, the 5575 limited edition on the right there. Um, these are kind of, you know, uh, workhorses of uh, the, the microphone industry. And the 55 sort of unique in that it, you know, was kind of a, a groundbreaking dynamic microphone in and of itself. We actually did a whole webinar on that topic last summer. If you're interested in learning about the history of that microphone, you can go um, look up that webinar. Uh, but in any case, dynamic microphones are uh, very popular for a number of good reasons. Um, they tend to be very rugged and reliable and relatively low cost as well, especially when you consider how good they generally sound and how reliable they generally are. But let's take a look here at, you know, sort of the, the technology behind the dynamic mic. Yeah, dynamic microphones work just kind of like a loudspeaker does, um, where you have a diaphragm, and that's normally made out of mylar, and it's formed into some shape. Uh, and attached to that mylar diaphragm is a voice coil um, made out of copper or aluminum-clad copper. And uh, that assembly is suspended around a magnet. Um, and it, it fits that coil fits inside of what's known as the gap, which is in between the magnet and the pull piece. Uh, the pull piece is that is that uh, thing on the right that has those little slots in it. Um, and that pull piece basically directs the magnetic field uh, of the magnet towards the coil. And when you induce that magnetic field across the coil, you get voltage across it, and we can capture that uh, coil. And we literally take the coil leads and r route them right to your XLR connector, and uh, you can capture that sound as it strikes that diaphragm and moves that coil within that magnetic field. Um, it's pretty simple and rugged and reliable, and uh, we've done it for a long time pretty well. And uh, the 55 Unidyne, which Gina was talking about, was the first unidirectional uh, dynamic microphone on the market that utilized this principle of using one element to capture a directional source. You, uh, prior to that, you had to use two elements and, com and combine them together. So um, every dynamic microphone today is, is done like this, uh, based on our design, uh, and every di directional dynamic microphone for sure. Uh, but um, it's a pretty down and dirty, easy, convenient way to get audio uh, from the world into an electrical output. So the pieces that you're seeing here, I mean, really, I mean, except for like, like John said, the the XLR connector on the output, some of dynamic mics maybe have a transformer in there. That's about all the parts there really are to a dynamic microphone. So, you know, you don't really have a lot of complexity there. There's no active electronics, so the microphone doesn't require any power. There's less that can just go wrong with it, which is part of what makes them so rugged and reliable and environmentally stable and and all of that good stuff. And again, also helps contribute to their uh, relatively uh, um, low cost as well, yet still capture um, pretty high sound quality. Um, you know, some of the trade-offs, of course, then would be uh, size. For one thing, a dynamic microphone has to be of a certain size to really sound good, so they can't be effectively miniaturized like you might be able to do with a condenser microphone. So dynamic microphones are, you know, s somewhat you know, somewhat of a size. And then the, the coil of wire adds quite a bit of mass to the microphone in and of itself. And, and therefore, dynamic microphones are not as sensitive, again, as compared to other mics like a condenser microphone. So they're not as good for more distant applications. They're more designed with you can be within, you know, a foot or so of the microphone or closer um, so that, you know, the, the microphone picks up that sound well. Yeah, and a dynamic microphone is a perfect accelerometer, so it kind of requires a pretty nice shock mount. Um, they are more prone to handling noise than condenser microphones are. Uh, most of our most of our dynamic mics at Share have what we call a pneumatic shock mount, which helps prevent uh, significantly reduce handling noise into the product. So the SM58, the SM57, uh, the Beta58 all have 
um, pneumatic shock mounts inside of them, which help uh, reduce handling noise and stage vibrations from entering your your, your dynamic mic. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about sensitivity in a little bit when we talk about the electrical output of the microphone, but that is one way you differentiate microphones is sensitivity, meaning how much output level do you get from the microphone from a given input source. So if you consider, again, a, 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 when we say a dynamic microphone is less sensitive, again, that means that you know it needs to you know get hit with a little more signal level to give you a decent output which is again why dynamic mics are great for up close application on loud sources loud instruments loud singers but maybe not the right choice for when you're miking a choir for example you know i nothing makes me cringe more when i see someone miking a choir with sm58s again if they're up there for the soloist to come right up to and sing great but when it's from a distance um you know the dynamic microphone may be might not be the best choice based on some of these characteristics. But when you start looking at condenser microphones, now you're talking about a microphone that is much more sensitive than a dynamic microphone and is better suited for distant miking applications. The dynamic mic element also has, is somewhat limited in terms of the frequency response you can get from the microphone, which is, you know, they, they sound pretty good, but there's sort of a limit you can hit to how, how good it can sound in terms of both its naturalness as well as the range of frequencies that it can pick up. And we'll see more about that when we get into frequency response. But the condenser microphone, again, doesn't really have those same sort of restrictions. So there's, um, as well as a sensitivity issue, there's also a sound quality issue that you can get into with condenser microphones. And let's take a look at the inside of one here. Yeah, we got a sh shot of the basic components of a condenser mic. Um, it's also a mylar diaphragm, but normally it's it's gold sputtered or coated in a conductive material. Um, there's a back plate, which is normally charged either externally or charged in the factory, which would be called an electric condenser mic versus an externally biased condenser mic. Um, but the back plate is charged with a with a voltage. And then in between the diaphragm and the back plate is known as a spacer, a spacer washer. Um, it's that thin little ring of plastic there on top of the perforated metal part. And that thing is extremely small. Uh, it will, it is about one one thousandth of an inch in thickness, um, and uh, that's the only distance. That's the only thing between your diaphragm and your back plate. So uh, you can get that kind of what creates the sensitivity, the higher outputs, um, and we can generally this can scale easily from a large diaphragm down to a small diaphragm down to a miniature five millimeter in diameter size. So um, generally, condenser microphones are used for lavaliers and headsets. Um, because they can get much smaller than a dynamic microphone can. Um, it does require, though, what's known as phantom power to, to run a condenser microphone because there's the output of this cartridge of this condenser mic is very high impedance, and it requires a lot of buffering and circuitry to kind of make the signal usable um, in a typical XLR output fashion. So uh, it requires circuitry and what's sometimes known as a JFET or a field effect transistor, which helps buffer the sound and get the sound in a usable state. So um, phantom power is needed for, for almost all condenser, well, all condenser microphones need phantom power to run that circuitry that's involved to get it into a usable signal. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that electronics, the one thing that you have to be aware of then is that um, the, the active components, there's a, a, a threshold, a point where they can maybe be overdriven or overloaded by too much signal. So depending on the design of the microphone itself and where its sensitivity is at, you may have to be more aware of things like potentially overloading the microphone. And something I didn't mention about the dynamic microphone, but is an important thing to know about it, is that a dynamic microphone is... I won't say it's impossible to overload it, but it's pretty much impossible by a, a human, even with a musical instrument, to make enough sound pressure level to overload a dynamic microphone. You pretty much have to mic um, a rocket ship taking off at very close range in order to create enough sound pressure level to get distortion within a dynamic microphone itself. I don't believe there's a singer on the planet Earth that could actually cause distortion in a dynamic microphone itself. You might get distortion somewhere else further down the signal path in the mixer or somewhere else because of an incorrect gain setting, but the microphone itself will not be overloaded. Again, a condenser mic, it could happen. Some mics have pads in order to be able to deal with that, and you might need to adjust that accordingly, but it is, again, another thing to be aware of on the condenser microphone. Here's really kind of the crux of the difference uh, between the two microphones here. What you're looking at is the uh, measured uh, 
measurement of a spark gap, so a really quick transient right in front of the microphone so you can see how the output level varies or the output signal characteristic varies between a condenser and a dynamic microphone. And you'll kind of notice because the condenser microphone has so much less mass than a dynamic microphone, it gets moving a lot faster. So if this peak is kind of the, the peak response at that spark, the, the dynamic, the condenser mic is coming down almost fully into the negative part of its response, whereas the dynamic mic is still just getting up to its peak. So the this is showing that the dynamic microphone takes longer to get going. And then once it does, this kind Kind of ripple at the back end here is showing it takes a lot longer for it to settle down too. So whenever you have something with more mass that is harder to get moving, it's also harder to make it stop moving as well. And so all of this is kind of what leads to that, you know, dynamic mic being not as sensitive as a condenser and not having the same sort of sound quality as well due to the the motion of the the diaphragm in and of itself. So this just kind of get, again gives you a visual sort of difference um, between the two. Again, both sound good. It's just there's a little bit more of a more limitation on the dynamic microphone itself. Uh, and then finally, the cousin of the dynamic mic is the ribbon microphone. Yeah, and a ribbon microphone is uh, generally beloved for its warm sound quality um, and darkness and richness. Uh, and a ribbon mic um, is a is a uh, is a per traditionally it's been a, a perforated piece of metal that or not a perforated but a um, a, uh, a formed piece of of metal a foil uh, traditionally we use a material called rosalite which is a, a nano bonded film um, and we use that because it's it doesn't has a much higher SPL it won't tear it's much more durable than a traditional foil ribbon would be but that ribbon is suspended in between two magnets and uh, is exposed on both sides. So you actually get sound in a bi-directional pattern uh, where it's ex where it can pick up sound in the front and the back equally uh, and rejects from the sides. And ribbon microphones are, are you know, the, the ribbon itself is both the coil and the diaphragm in a, in a dynamic mic. And they are uh, great sounding options to tame any sort of harsh sources like a trumpet or a really bright vocalist or a kind of edgy guitar amplifier ribbon microphones will kind of tame and smooth and darken and and really like niceify if i could make up a word uh niceify the things that are, are very harsh uh, they are naturally bi-directional though and that leads us into our polar pattern discussion excellent about excellent. how does a microphone react to sound coming from different angles Nice segue. Um, so yes, um, this is an important characteristic now. So we've, we've covered how microphones kind of work, how they do what they do, but now we're going to talk about how the microphone responds to sounds coming at it from different directions. Um, this is something that you kind of have to, you know, read about or research on the microphone to really know for sure, because you can't tell by looking at a microphone what it's directional response is going to be. A lot of people make the assumption, for example, that the SM58 is an omnidirectional microphone because it has a, a ball windscreen on it, which I guess sort of looks like, you know, a three-dimensional omnidirectional pattern, but that's not true. The uh, SM58 is a unidirectional microphone, meaning it only picks up sound from one direction. So again, you have to look at um, at the actual specs of the microphone or read sometimes it's actually printed on the microphone what its pattern is i guess that would be one way to tell by looking at the microphone but you can't just you can't just guess so that's kind of the two broad categories though that we have either omnidirectional meaning it picks up sound from all directions or unidirectional meaning it, meaning it only picks up sound from one direction so uh, omnidirectional is great because you don't have to worry about pointing the microphone in any particular way it will it's equally sensitive to sound arriving at it from all angles but that can also be a detriment particularly in a loud sound reinforcement scenario where you've got, you know, drum kits and guitar amplifiers and all these other sounds on stage, the microphone will per be perfectly happy to pick up all of that stuff, which in a more, you know, an environment where you're mixing individual sounds, you probably want to have the microphone just picking up that individual sound. So again, it, the, the choice kind of depends on the application, um, but there are definitely some advantages to omnidirectional mics as well. Um, they don't have any change in sound quality as the distance varies with the microphone. With any sort of unidirectional microphone, you get something that's called proximity effect, which is an increase in bass response as the sound source gets closer to the microphone. Omnidirectional microphones don't have that characteristic. And again, that characteristic is neither good nor bad. In fact, some 
people actually happen to like what it this what it does to their voice when you get bass here as you get close to the microphone but it's just something to be aware of as a as a difference between the two um, omnidirectional microphones are also less sensitive to things like wind noise and handling noise and other anomalies that you don't want um, to be picked up. But again, on the downside, they do pick up everything. And uh, that can be also be problematic in uh, loud environments where feedback is an issue, since the microphone uh, isn't discerning at all from any direction. Doesn't matter which way you point the microphone, it's going to be perfectly happy to pick up the sound from the loudspeakers, which could lead to a feedback loop as well. So that's also something to be aware of. So in, you know, in, in recording applications and broadcast applications, omnidirectional is totally fine. You don't have those concerns. In the large percentage of live sound reinforcement scenarios, it's probably more likely going to be unidirectional microphones, except for a case of like maybe musical theater or something like that, where you've got head-worn microphones that are very close to the mouth. Then the, uh, the, the gain before feedback issue isn't as much of a problem because uh, if you've ever attended our webinar on how to maximize gain before feedback, you know that keeping the microphone close to the sound source is the best way to maximize that. And so a head-worn mic is very close to your mouth, so you can get away with an Omni, and, uh, and it works well in that particular scenario. And then we have cardioid pattern mics. Yeah, directional microphones. Cardioid is the most common for sure. Um, and we say it's cardioid because it is shaped like a heart, uh, cardiovascular. Um, Looking on the graph on the right, that's a top-down view. Uh, so zero degrees would be on axis or the front of the mic, and directly behind the microphone at 180 degrees is off axis, and that's where you receive the most amount of rejection on a cardioid response to microphone. Um, I would say 50 to 75% of all unidirectional microphones out there are probably cardioid. And... Uh, there's a reason for that. They're forgiving on their on-axis performance in terms of if you want to sneak maybe two people on a cardioid mic, you probably can. You can get away with it. Um, you lose about 60 B, uh, which is a, a noticeable change on the sides of the mic, so at 90, at the 90s, and then you get the most rejection in the rear. So uh, a great solution for a lot of applications um, that you'll find on stage and in the studio too. So again, the advantage is you know, you pick up what the microphone is aimed at and a lot less of everything else. Um, and as John mentioned, it's a good compromise between some of the other directional patterns, um, which get more and more directional as you move to the to the right on this chart, starting at Omni, each pattern here, you have more and more off axis rejection, which means that you have to be more and more concerned particularly in like a handheld application of making sure that you stay in front of the microphone because the response starts to drop off more dramatically as you get from supercardioid to hypercardioid. A trade-off you might note though is that as you get more or increased rejection at the sides of the mic, you end up with a little bit of pickup at the back of the microphone. It's kind of like squeezing a balloon in the middle or something. You know, you start to get one side gets, you know, smaller on the top means it has to get bigger on the bottom. So you end up with a little bit of pickup at the back and that gets even more extreme at hypercardioid and then, you know, keep going and eventually you end up at a bi-directional microphone then where your greatest rejection is at 90 degrees off axis uh, and the pickup at the front and the back is actually equal. That's when a bi-directional mic like the ribbon microphones uh, the kind of pattern that they actually happen to have. So again, it's all about trade-offs, you know. So one thing to watch out for is if you give a super cardioid microphone to an untrained uh, user, then you have to worry more about as they start moving off to the side of the microphone, it tends to the response, the pickup will drop off a lot faster. So for untrained users, maybe they're better off with a cardioid. Uh, or maybe you just like to be able to have a little bit wider working range as you're using the microphone. Um, or maybe you don't want to deal with this lobe at the back, you know, which gives you a little bit of pickup and impacts stage monitor placement. All of these things are important things to consider when you're thinking about the different pickup patterns of the microphone. And some microphones even have switchable pickup patterns, which is a nice feature. Sometimes you can choose between omni or cardioid or uh, cardioid and supercardioid. These are all um, features to, to look for and think about. So now we're going to move into a frequency response of the microphone, which is basically 
how it sounds. Um, but that can be plotted on a graph. Now, does that tell you everything? I mean, it can give you an idea of what the microphone sounds like. It's still not the same as actually listening to it. But on any frequency response chart, what you're looking at is uh, along the horizontal axis is the range of frequencies that humans can hear from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. At least when you're a newborn, you can hear that. I don't know if we can hear that anymore. Definitely but, not. <laughs> uh, at some point in our lives, we could. And then on the Y axis, you're you're looking at the output measured output level of the microphone at those different frequencies. So when we talk about a microphone having flat frequency response, that basically means that this microphone at any given frequency, the output is mostly the same or it's so it ends up looking like a flat line. So this is very natural, very wide ranging frequency response. It's not going to color the sound. It's not going to change the sound. It's going to pick up pretty much everything equally versus shaped frequency response. Uh, again, it should be pretty obvious why we call it shaped frequency response, but now what you can see is that at different frequencies, the output level or sensitivity of the microphone changes. So this particular microphone um, is less sensitive at lower frequencies and actually more sensitive or has higher output at higher frequencies. So um, you're actually getting a boost in a certain range here. And you might look at that and think, well, wouldn't you always want this? Isn't flat frequency response the best if it's natural? and picks up everything, well, you might not necessarily want to pick up everything. If you consider the sound source that you're trying to pick up with the microphone, you have to look at the range of frequencies that that particular sound source is capable of producing and pick a microphone that picks up that range. And unless you're doing like an, a, you know, a giant pipe organ or maybe a grand piano or something like that, you really don't need a microphone with 20 to 20 thousand hertz response if you pick up a lot of low frequency uh if you have a lot of low frequency response that's not needed then you might end up just picking you know wind noise or handling noise or stage vibration things that you don't want that all tends to be down here in the lower part of the frequency range so using a microphone that kind of naturally rolls all that stuff off will actually clean up the sound and make things better so if this were a vocal microphone it actually is a vocal microphone this would be perfectly fine because unless you're the bass singer in a gospel choir, you probably don't need any frequency response, or at least not much below 100 hertz. So this kind of roll off is beneficial and you're not really sacrificing anything. And then as it turns out, uh, up here in the two to sort of five, six K range, this is what we refer to as a presence peak. What this is doing is boosting the response of the microphone in a range where consonant sounds are and consonants are what is important to intelligibility and understanding what's being said. So this is actually the response of the SM58 dynamic microphone. And part of the reason it's been so successful is because of this presence peak right here. Um, when, you know, rock bands started getting louder and louder and guitar players started turning up more and more, in order for the vocals to cut through, it really helped to have a microphone that kind of already was boosting this range and helping increase intelligibility. And then again, above about 10K or so, there's not a lot in the human voice really happening there, at least especially not that's as far as important to intelligibility. You know, in a recording application, you might want more stuff happening up here, but in a live sound application, it's pretty much unnecessary. So this tends to work. And this tends to be pretty typical of what you can achieve with a dynamic microphone. This sort of flat frequency response, it's you really can't get there with the condenser microphone. Yeah, condenser mics tend to... F with a dynamic mic, sorry. Yeah. You can with a condenser mic. Yeah, con condenser microphones tend to be more in the flat response nature and dynamic microphones just by physics. It's very difficult to make a flat... Um, sounding dynamic mic. It's just physics doesn't allow you to do that very well. So, because uh, you have three things to work with and you're, you're talking about manipulating air volumes and resistances and parts and diaphragms. And so, uh, you know, shaped response microphones tend to kind of be more in the dynamic realm and flat response microphones tend to be more in the condenser realm. You know, you can have shaped response condenser microphones, um, and they often are shaped that way for particular applications, mm -hmm. maybe, or to emphasize, again, a particular type of sound source. But um, the opposite is not true. Dynamic mics, this sort of flat frequency response that you can achieve with a condenser microphone, you pretty much can't get there with a the dynamic mic. Mm -hmm. So also something to think about. Um, we won't get too much into into uh, into uh, electronics here, but you do have to consider the electrical output of the microphone because it does impact uh, what you're connecting it to. 
uh, you really do need to kind of keep uh, just a couple of basic things in mind here. And part of it depends on whether or not it's going to be an analog or a digital device that you're ultimately connecting to, because a lot of people are uh, podcasting or doing recording on computers. And if you're connecting the microphone to the computer, what does that mean versus just say plugging it into an analog mic mixer or something with analog mic inputs? Probably the most important thing to consider is, the, again, the sensitivity of the microphone, which we mentioned earlier. Again, sensitivity is a, it's a measure of voltage based on a kind of a known given input source. I mean, there's all kinds of signal levels you could put into the microphone, but you have to sort of pick one to measure against. Um, but then once you've defined what that kind of input is, that allows you to sort of decide or, or see here uh, what the output level of the microphone might be. And so we've labeled a couple on here. We've got an SM58 dynamic microphone and a KSM44A condenser microphone. And you notice in this case, the difference between the two is about 20 dB. Now that doesn't necessarily go for all condenser Sensor microphones are not all 20 dB more sensitive or 25 dB more sensitive than a dynamic microphone, but they could be. KSM 44A is a pretty sensitive microphone, mm -hmm. but something like a Beta 87 that's designed for up close handheld vocal use like an SM58, its sensitivity might artificially be manipulated to be closer to an SM58 or maybe just a few dB more sensitive. So there's really no standard as that says all microphones have this exact same sensitivity. There's kind of a range. But the important thing to note is that a mixer's output level is going to be more what we call line level, which is 50 dB hotter than an SM58, right? So what that means is that that's why you have to plug a microphone into something that is labeled microphone input. You can't plug a microphone directly into a power amplifier that's looking for line level from a mixer because there's not near Nearly enough signal level there to drive it. And this also becomes important when you're looking at um, interfaces for computer recording, which we'll see a couple examples of in a minute here. But uh, you need to make sure that if you're using a low sensitivity microphone like the SM58 or even like an SM7, which is even lower than a SM58, that the device you're using for amplification has enough amplification to get that signal up to the sort of line level signal that we're interested in. So it's important to at least keep that in mind. The impedance is not as much of a problem anymore because pretty much all professional microphones are what's called a low impedance output and all uh, professional audio inputs that you might connect them to are designed to accept low impedance microphones. Um, again, if you happen to have some old mic from the 80s that's a high impedance mic and you plug it into a low impedance mic input on a newer mixer, you might have some problems with signal levels there that you need to address with a transformer or something like that. But in general, anything you're going to go to the store and buy today, it's probably going to work okay unless you're trying to plug it into a computer. Uh, computer audio inputs, like you see labeled here, are not really what we would consider a professional microphone input. They're wired differently, impedance is different, signal levels are different. They're pretty much horrible. Don't use them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, we we really don't recommend it. Uh, the eighth inch input on a computer that says either a mic in or a line in, or like if you just want to like actually don't use it don't even use it for that don't even <laughs> use it for anything so uh that that's this is where we really advise going towards a usb output microphone or, or using the usb port in an interface and we'll talk about some of the options out there um so it'll take your xlr inputs and through an interface and and give you uh and do the all the conversion all the analog to digital conversion externally outside of the computer because everything that's in, inside the computer is basically the the lowest cost manufactured thing that they can come up with. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if you want any sort of decent, good audio quality with, with low noise, which is important, and high signal, high signal output, uh, you're going to want to go to an interface or to a USB product that has all that stuff built into it. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple of great options out there now with for USB offerings and also to go into your iPhone or iOS products. We're, we're coming out with a couple of those. Um, but the key to when purchasing a USB product or a USB interface um, is to make sure you have a, a headphone port, a headphone jack on the actual interface. Um, that allows you to monitor the incoming signal directly before it goes to your computer. Uh, and that's important if you're going to do any sort of overdubbing or singing or talking to a track or uh, doing any sort of multi-tracking scenarios. Um, you want to be able to monitor, monitor the incoming signal before it hits the computer because if you try to monitor after it goes into the computer, you're going to be hit with all these latency issues uh, or delay issues where you're not quite in sync. It's going to sound like you're in this weird tin can because everything is delayed by 
50 or 100 or 200 milliseconds. It's going to be really annoying. So uh, all of our products um, all have headphone jacks on there for a reason so that you use them and you can monitor the source before it goes in, into your computer and you don't have any of these latency issues. So this is a great solution here for if you only need to record with one mic at a time because you're a podcaster or you're just a solo singer-songwriter kind of making demos at home. But as soon as you need to plug multiple microphones into your computer simultaneously for multi-track recording, uh, then you might want to get a recording interface uh, that connects to your computer, again, via USB or FireWire. Uh, and then you have analog mic inputs, hopefully with phantom power on them if you're using condenser microphones. I think most of these things do have phantom mm -hmm. power these days. Um, and then these, again, will do the, the same function but allow you to use multiple microphones connected to your computer. And finally, don't forget about the physical design of the microphone. There's not a lot to say about this other than be aware that microphones do come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes, including some very specialized mics for specialized applications like clipping onto the bell of a, a, a saxophone or something like that. Or, you know, they, they're small and they're large and they're handheld and they're stand mounted and there's head worn and there's all these different physical designs out there that, you know, you just have to pick the one that suits what, uh, what you need it for for your particular application. And speaking of applications, uh, let's go there now. So that, again, those are all the characteristics that really define microphones. So let's, again, just picking a few examples here, let's see how you might apply those uh, and think about how they impact what you're, what you're using them for. And we're going to start with one of the most common uses for a microphone, which is... The vocal, vocal mic. mic. The vocal <laughs> mic. So you have a singer like this. Like I've seen her somewhere before. You should. Um, Who is that crazy lady? <laughs> you should. You should step back from the speakers a little bit more if you're gonna be. If you're gonna be listening to this one because it's gonna get loud. <laughs> 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 So, do you know what kind of microphone is this? That well, that's a wireless version of an SM58. Why are we using an SM58 for singing? Um, because it's a dynamic microphone that can handle extremely high sound pressure levels, like I'm sure is being generated here. Yes. Um, and it has a nice directional pattern, so you're not picking up all the noise from that drummer that's uh, on stage and the guitar amps that are off to the left and the right and all all that other good stuff. Now, is that the only choice we could use? Of course not. Uh, there are many condenser microphones that are also designed for um, vocal and singing applications as well. Um, but again, if you're on maybe a quieter stage or you're trying to pick up um, the subtleties of the vocal performance, or maybe it's more of like a jazz or, a, or a, again, a singer-songwriter type application, you know, maybe that's something that has more of that extended high-frequency response and more natural response might be important. But the SM58 Presence Peak is definitely going to help when you're um, singing Iron Maiden songs. Yes. So, <laughs> uh, so you do have to kind of consider the whole application and then kind of, you know, apply that to which of those types of characteristics are going to be best suited. In this type of application, Maybe even a mic with a supercardioid or hypercardioid pattern might be more appropriate because it's going to pick up even less of that um, of that stage, on bleed. stage bleed. Yeah, the on stage noise. So those are again the kind of things that we're that we're talking about here. The things that we can rule out. This application, you're not going to use an omnidirectional microphone. Um, probably not too many ribbon microphones that are suited for this either. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so. But I on the on the other hand, I have seen. You know, KSM44, large diaphragm mics used on stage for like Nashville and bluegrass oh, and bluegrass thing. stuff. Certainly. And I've seen SM7s used as vocal mics. And so, you know, it all kind of depends on your form factor and, and what's going to drive that. But I'd say typical handheld applications are going to you're going to fall into this vocal. Right. Unidirectional vocal. cardioid or condenser if it's designed to handle the up-close sound pressure levels that you need here. Mm -hmm. um, and this is kind of a live sound application. In recording, you might have a different set of requirements. In fact, in a recording application, you probably wouldn't want to use a handheld microphone because all handheld microphones, even ones with really, really good shock mounts, there's still some chance that you're going to get some handling noise, which in a recording application, could 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 ruin the take. A live sound, it doesn't really matter so much. But in a recording application, you don't want to take ruined by you know the the uh, singer tapping their hand on the microphone. So you're going to more of a stand mounted thing, where maybe the the large diaphragm type condenser microphone becomes more of what you might you know mm -hmm. choose for that application. Maybe even an omnidirectional mic if you're in a good sounding room. But if you're recording in your closet at home, well, I'll, who knows what kind of reflections? Again, you want that that directional pattern to help you out in that application. Um, speech is also another type thing that you might uh, need to, to to record or capture as well. Yeah, and so, so podcasting is, is 
is going well now with a lot of people and uh, very popular. And so we have a couple great USB offerings now. Um, generally, if you're gonna be, if you know you're going into computer and that's all you want to do all the time, going with a USB microphone or a, or any iOS microphone is going to be the way to go. Um, so uh, generally, our our USB offerings are, are condenser microphones because they're a little more sensitive. Uh, you can get further away from them and still get nice clarity and pick up. And uh, they, they sound really good, they're easy to use, um, and they all have direct USB outputs on them and with mic gain and headphone out and all that stuff. So uh, they all have stands on them now, so you can just sit on your desktop really easily. Um, so, uh, you know, podcasting, we have some large diaphragm and small diaphragm offerings, which we'll talk about the differences in the next slide or two. Um, let's talk about electric guitar for a minute. Again, as you can see from what's pictured on the slide here, either dynamic or condenser microphones can be um, appropriate for this situation. Um, again, one thing they're all going to have in common, though, is they all are some sort of a directional pickup pattern, because um, if it's being used in a sound reinforcement or, or even a recording environment, depending on how you're recording, you know, you might not want to pick up a lot of everything else that's going around. Um, plus the proximity effect you can take advantage of here when the microphone is nice and close to the sound source. One thing you do want to look out for if you're using a condenser microphone like you see here, the KSM44A is a, uh, a pretty sensitive microphone, um, but it also has a pad that you can kick in, which makes Makes it then appropriate for use up close on an amplifier like this um, versus say like we have a, a KSM uh, like 42 which is more designed for vocal applications and doesn't have a pad on it mm -hmm. um, maybe that wouldn't work as well on your guitar amplifier then because you might hit it with way too much signal when it's pressed up against the speaker just like that is so those are things you need to be aware of if you're going to choose a condenser mic for this application is make sure it has sensitivity or at least adjustable sensitivity that make it work for that um, particular situation. Yeah, a lot of people like double micing electric guitars too. So they'll mic with a, with a dynamic mic and a condenser microphone. They get the two different tones out of the same guitar amp because you can blend the two later. So it's a, and ribbon microphones are also very, very nice on guitar. Uh, they take the edge off, they, they smooth things out, they warm things up. Um, so uh, ribbon mics are also a nice option, uh, especially our ribbon mics because they don't really have they have a much higher SPL handling capability than than older traditional ribbons do. So uh, ribbon mics are also nice. Yeah. Again, probably not using looking at omnidirectional mics here, but if you are in a recording application in a good sounding room and you want to pick up more of that sound of the room, then maybe you might choose an omnidirectional mic here. But you know, and and again, in most cases, it's going to be more of that cardioid type. Uh, type pattern on the on the guitars here, and again the, the the dynamic mic with that shaped frequency response does tend to lend it well, particularly to distorted you know rock guitar sounds. That's why the 57 is so popular for that. But if you want something a little wider ranging and more natural and picking up more subtleties, again the condenser mic can help with that, or the ribbon mic to kind of darken up the sound. Um, now, speaking of condenser microphones, it is worth noting that there are um, what are sort of categorically described as large diaphragm and small diaphragm condenser microphones. And even though this isn't officially sort of codified or anywhere, we typically think of a large diaphragm microphone as being like about a one inch diaphragm. Small diaphragm could be anything smaller than that, but usually like about like say like a one centimeter or smaller cartridge would be a small diaphragm microphone. And sometimes, you know, if you read a lot of forums and things, you might get start to get the impression that, well, geez, I really need a large diaphragm condenser microphone, but that's not necessarily always the case, right? Yeah, not totally true. It kind of depends on, what, like everything in audio, it depends on what you want to do with it. So uh, large diaphragm mics generally do, because they have a larger surface area on, on the diaphragm, you can get a higher output uh, level. So the sensitivity is generally higher on large diaphragms. That's why you'll see pads on a lot of large diaphragm mics f to be able to handle high SPL applications. Um, but actually s smaller diaphragm mics like a half inch or a three quarter inch diaphragm will actually have a wider frequency range than a, a larger diaphragm mic will. Um, it, uh, and also the biggest thing to know is like off axis consistency or the directionality effect is less. So um, thing the you know, microphone obviously captures what you're pointing it at, but also captures everything else in the room at a reduced level, but it also still captures it. So uh, smaller diaphragm microphones are tend to be favored for um, for recording, like 
larger ensembles or uh, orchestra mics or uh, anything that um, you want a cleaner off-axis uh, sound. Um, the reason for that is a smaller diaphragm mic is smaller and um, has less reflections around it. And uh, when you stick a large diaphragm microphone inside of a cage and you're addressing it on the side, um, most likely, you get a lot more reflections in that in that pickup of the mic. And uh, it tends to be not as clean as you will off axis in terms of the, the image that you get. So, um, so small diaphragm microphones tend to be a little bit more consistent in that respect. I think it's important to understand too that um, size doesn't matter when you're talking about needing to pick up low frequency response. There's often a misperception that large diaphragm mics have better low frequency response because they're bigger and they're therefore bigger at picking up longer wavelengths. But the ability of a microphone to pick up um, pick up certain frequencies has n has nothing to do with its size when we're talking about condenser microphones and and very tiny condenser microphones can still be very good at picking up sometimes clear down to to 20 hertz or so but the large diaphragm microphones they actually tend to be less sensitive at higher frequencies maybe than or at least less linear than a small diaphragm mic might be so there's a perception then that they sound warmer or darker and it's really because of that reason which for certain vocals or certain guitars might be what you want and that might be the sound that you're going for and that would be an application for a large diaphragm microphone then instead so when you're looking at things like acoustic guitar now we're starting to get into things where really condenser microphones start to become the primary choice um, again because you're miking from more of a distance because you're picking up a sound source that you want to try and capture more accurately the characteristics of the condenser microphone start to become uh, more important could you mic an acoustic guitar with an SM57? Sure you could. It might sound pretty decent. Probably happens every day. Probably happens every day. <laughs> but you want to go for the best possible sound quality that you can capture. The condenser mics, large or small diaphragm, depending on the sound quality that you happen to personally like, either one could be um, appropriate there. Um, so that's where you start getting into that. And again, normally going to be cardioid. If it's any sort of a sound reinforcement or a noisy room recording, maybe you might Omni, it really just kind of depends on on what you're doing there, but definitely more of a condenser mic application, as it would be for grand piano as well. Again, you're talking about a very wide frequency range that you need to pick up here, and and that that type of again, it's a good sounding piano, and you want it to sound like the piano, then you're probably not going to put an SM58 inside of there, right? You're going to want something that is more wide ranging and more natural sounding to pick up the sound of that instrument, and that really applies to also, any kind of ensemble as well. I mean, we don't have a slide for it here, but when we're talking about acoustic ensembles, an orchestra, a small chamber group, a string quartet, a brass quartet, whatever it happens to be, you're more at a distance, you're trying to pick up the whole ensemble and the whole range of sounds that that ensemble is creating, you're really looking at condenser type microphones with flat natural frequency response for that application. Yeah, for for grand piano for me it all depends on on what, what instrumentation is around it. Is it live or is it in the studio? Can you control the environment because it's such a big instrument. Uh, if you want to if you want to record a piano that you know in the studio and you, and that's all you're recording, awesome. You can put that mic wherever you want, but but if you're on stage and you got a drum set inside the curve of the piano and you're trying to get as much gain out of that microphone as you can, you're going to be trying to get that thing really close to the hammers and get it as get it really close mic'd and try and get the lid closed and using blankets. So it's uh, all comes down to kind of your environment and and what kind of what what is around that piano. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure we have time to get to a few questions. I'm going to kind of breeze through drums here because drums is sort of a complex topic because when you're miking a drum kit, you're not miking an instrument. You're dry miking several instruments all in very close proximity to one another. Now what that helps you think about though in terms of like directionality can be a huge advantage here. Um, that's why uh, like a lot of our original drum mics were available in the beta series dynamics with super cardioid patterns, right? So you can get a lot of mics in a small amount of space, but not be picking up a lot of the other drums that are close to it. And again, dynamic mics are great in applications where uh, the sound pressure level is very high, which of course it is when you're into inches from a drum head or millimeters sometimes from a drum head. Now, again, there are condenser mics that are specifically optimized for close miking on drums, and that's where that sensitivity specification comes into play again. You want a microphone with lower sensitivity that can handle being that close to a drum. In fact, 
um, skipping ahead to the Tom Toms here. This is a condenser microphone, the Beta 98A, that is specifically optimized to be right there, right close to the drum. Would you do that with something like a KSM 141 condenser microphone? Probably not, although that mic does have a 25 dB pad on it, so maybe it could handle it Everything. if you did that. Um, but those are things that you need to consider when you're miking drums, is being able to handle loud sound pressure levels and being directional enough to only pick up the drum that it's in front of. And then there are, again, something to go back to the kick drum again, the Beta 52 here, its frequency response is specifically tailored to be optimized for sound quality that is designed for drums. Again, it's it's not a kick drum mic because of the way it looks, although that's the way most people kind of think a kick drum mic should look. Um, but it's it, it has the sound signature that you need for that application that makes it pretty specialized for that. I don't know a lot of other instruments you might use that microphone on other than the kick drum because of how it's specifically tailored. And again, uh, overhead microphones on drums, Condenser microphone picks up the high frequencies of the cymbals very well, and you can get away with things that are a little more sensitive because they're elevated and a little bit further away. Some additional resources you might want to investigate because we're really just kind of scratching the surface here are the Sure blog, which has, if you go under topics and education, you can find all kinds of great blog posts, many of which the images for this um, webinar were stolen from our blog, so you can find all kinds of good stuff there. Our YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash Sure Inc. has a playlist of educational videos, particularly good ones to look at are Understanding Mic Specifications. It's a four-part series that covers all of this stuff. Um, we have a mic listening lab on our website where you can go hear the microphones at, on various sound sources in various positions, which really helps as well. And then don't forget about our uh, training website as well, where you can find webinar archives and links to some educational publications that are really um, useful for learning more about this topic. Topic. So as I said, we just kind of scratch the surface here. But ultimately, as I said, it's your choice. If there's any way to audition the microphones and actually get a chance to listen to them, uh, that's how you're going to know the best. All of these other things we talked about help you narrow the field down to get down to something that you really have to try out and find the one that's going to work best for you. Cheryl? All right. Um, we don't have too many questions, um, so we'll just kind of go through these here. If you have any, please get them in now. Um, the first and only question I have right now is uh, asking if you could touch on improper and proper on-axis mic technique, i.e. cupping the microphone. Oh, uh, great question. You want don't it? cup the microphone. <laughs> there you go. So, Done. <laughs> so, but why, John? Why should yeah, you cup the microphone? So all directional microphones have uh, side entry ports. So we... Basically, every every microphone, except for ribbons, but every microphone wants to be an omnidirectional microphone, and we do a whole bunch of stuff to break that and turn it into a directional microphone. And the way you do that is you you allow sound to strike uh, under the diaphragm, as opposed and along with on top of the diaphragm. So um, we do that through these side entry ports. And if you pull off a, the grill on an SM58, you'll see this perforated metal slit around the side of it. And that allows sound to strike under the diaphragm. When you close those ports off, you're essentially turning it into a really bad omnidirectional mic. Along with, so omni it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, because if you were to close those ports off completely, you basically can turn it into a decent, okay, omnidirectional microphone. But in that process, you also make the sound horrible. Uh, it gets really nasally and and um, thin sounding and. So uh, basically, keep your hand off the grill on any handheld directional mic, uh, and you you will thank your engineer will thank you, and you will thank yourself because you will sound better for your audience. Um, you will have more clarity. Uh, you won't have as much feedback because you're not turning your microphone into an omnidirectional microphone, uh, and uh, it's just overall just a really bad technique to get into. Uh, everybody does it. Everybody does it because you look cool. you look so cool, man. When you don't do you it. just can't. You just can't hear myself. Be a trendsetter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we've got some more questions. Um, what effects, good or bad, do windscreens and pop filters introduce to the microphone performance, and when should you use such devices? Well, windscreen, I mean, it serves a very specific purpose, right? Directional microphones, omnidirectional mics are great because they actually don't need windscreens as much as unidirectional mics do. But unidirectional microphones are are much more sensitive to wind noise, and that's partially due to the to the porting that John mentioned when we talked about how we make a microphone be unidirectional. So wind blows across it, and you get that 
really horrible rumbly sound so you put a windscreen over the microphone to try and reduce that some mics like the sm58 actually have sort of a built-in windscreen that is uh, um there's a foam underneath the mesh metal mesh windscreen as well that provides layers of protection but sometimes you need to add any more what you have to watch out for is the more material you put in the way it can start to affect the high frequency response of the microphone so that might be a trade-off that you'd have to watch out for yeah um in general, though, if you are outside, the trade-off of having less wind noise in your microphones is better than the high frequency loss that you may get when you start sticking very really thick windscreens over top of your bog grills and stuff like that. All things in audio, it's a trade-off or a compromise, and you have to take the lesser of two evils. Yeah. What about pop filters? Pop filters are uh, very similar in their fashion. You know, it's almost like a windscreen. You could kind of, they're interchangeable in some respect. Uh, but pop filters, uh, so when we say pop, we mean, I will attempt to pop this mic. Uh, it's it's the pop you get when you say P's or T's, uh, and you'll get this big puff of air that goes into your mic, and it will kind of sound weird. Um, pop filters, uh, the pantyhose style like pop filter you might see, uh, our PS6 is what we call it. For studio, there's very little effect on audio quality when you use those types of pop filters in the studio. Um, you would definitely receive the benefit of blocking those plosives before they hit the diaphragm. Um, and a windscreen, traditional windscreen, will also help you get less pops in your mic as well. And that's why you'll see those on like announcement mics or TV host mics. You'll see a, a windscreen on top of the grill to help with plosives. A little known trick that a lot of people don't, don't know is rather than employing a pop filter, if you actually hold the microphone or put the microphone at more of an angle to the mouth instead of directly in line in front of your lips, that will actually help minimize those plosives. So rather than going again right into it, go a little off to the side, and then the breath blast will go past the microphone instead of right into it. And then you may not even need a popper stopper just by changing the angle a little bit. Mm -hmm. Here's a really interesting question. You talked about reliability with the dynamic mics. Do condenser mics need to be replaced more frequently? And how long would you consider the quote-unquote life of a microphone to be? Well, um, I would say traditionally condenser microphones used to be uh, not as rugged as dynamic mics. I would probably buck that myth and say all, all of our condenser microphones that at least we make here at Sure are equally as rugged as our dynamic microphones are. Uh, from a corporate quality standpoint, just because we have we make a condenser microphone doesn't mean we lax our quality standards. So uh, a KSM44 studio microphone goes through the same drop test and moisture resistance and humidity and hot, hot and cold storage that the SM58 goes through. So um, I would say that's probably one of the benefits you get when you when you purchase a Sure mic is you're buying that rugged and reliability regardless of what kind of microphone you choose. Um, now, if you have some sort of vintage tube condenser microphone from the 1940s, do you have to be a little bit more careful with something like that? Absolutely. But yes. we're talking about, you know, modern, newly manufactured condenser mics. Yeah, if you drop your case in 44, it's not going to break. If you drop your case in ribbon, it's not going to break. You know, it's uh, they're... They're just as rugged in general as our dynamics now. We actually just recently added a YouTube video to our YouTube channel. If you visit uh, the Sure YouTube channel, where we do show you some of the testing we do with our ribbon microphones, um, and we do, you'll see drop tests with those, and you'll see one in front of a, a bass drum, and it's it's actually really interesting. So there's some cool slow mo video on that mm -hmm. one. This is nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, what kind of microphones would you recommend for radio doing radio spots? You say radio, I say SM7. <laughs> that was easy. Uh, that's pretty much the de facto um, radio broadcast mic uh, in the, of the world, I would say. Um, you know, the SM7 and the RE20 are both great options, but the, uh, you know, we're obviously a little more favored towards the SM7 because it's our microphone. Um, but that's a uh, large. That's a that's a our biggest, best sounding. Uh, dynamic mic that we offer uh, and actually you know we talk about shape versus flat response the sm7 has a very flat response for being a dynamic mic and that's pretty much why a lot of people love it as a better alternative or a different alternative to condenser microphones um if you're looking for more of that kind of traditional fm radio dj smooth sort of a sound the sm7 just has that kind of sound quality that darkness to it that a condenser microphone is just always going to be a little more 
shrill. A little zippier, a little brighter, a little more shrill that you may not want for that specific sound. So again, that's why being able to hear these mics becomes such an important thing. On the condenser side, the KSM42 is a great option. Uh, it comes with a, a magnetic pop filter that fits right over the shock mount. Um, uh, and it's a really good voice tailor like, for, for voiceover. So uh, they're, they're both great options. Okay. And then just one last question here. We have time for one last one. Um, omnidirectional is better for rejecting wind noise. However, this causes issues when the user is in front of the sound system outdoors. What lab style microphone would you recommend to offer the best both wind rejection as well as being directional? Um, lavalier mics and wind is a constant problem outdoors. Um, you need a big windscreen. You need a big windscreen, uh, and you need a directional lav, and that brings other challenges too with people moving their heads back and forth. And I would say, you know, if you can, if you can force, or force, but convince somebody to use a headset microphone over a lavalier microphone outdoors in a PA system, uh, you're going to be much better off with just game before feedback and wind reduction. Uh, but uh, our WL-185 lavalier uh, is a directional one centimeter lav that comes with a windscreen. Um, and outdoors on a lav, you're gonna most likely wanna pick up some additional wind protection. Um, you're not gonna wanna go to Omni's like, because you're gonna have game before feedback issues. Uh, but uh, you're gonna, Rycoat is a R-Y-C-O-T-E, is a company that makes um, additional wind protection for our products as a third party uh, accessory manufacturer that is really good and well respected in the industry. Um, and uh, you can pick up little mini furries that can slip over our windscreens to give you even more wind protection on a directional mic outside. Fantastic. All right. Lots of great information. We hope you learned something today. Um, please join us next month. We're going to be talking about a very hot topic as per usual, feedback. Um, so please keep your eyes peeled. We'll be having that. Uh, do we have the date for that one yet, Gino? Uh, we had the date of... June 29th. June 29th. Great. Um, Shore.com slash training for updates. You can also subscribe to get an email so you'll, you'll be notified when our future webinars are coming up. So thank you so much for joining us and we will see you next month.